Hey everybody and welcome to the 8th episode of Brent Ewing's Hey Buddy Podcast. On today's show I'm going to be talking with an old friend, Matt Peterson. Him along with Jeremy Smith and Nathan Mollahan are bringing the original Rocket Pizza recipe back to Wellston. The original Rocket Pizza will be opening up here pretty soon. I wanted to, to talk to Matt a little bit about that. We're also going to talk about old times. I've known Matt for a very long time, about 30 years now, and uh, we have a lot of fun stories, a lot of fun history. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, talk a little bit about school, but you know, I, I know a lot of people here are uh, really clamoring for that new Rocket Pizza ever since they, they started making their, uh, making their posts on Facebook and kind of getting people excited and wondering if, the, if Rocket Pizza was coming back. So Matt's going to talk a little bit about that and what you guys can expect. So I hope you guys enjoy the interview. What's going on, man? Peterson, what's up, buddy? Oh, yeah. one thing after another, man. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a good time? Are you okay to talk for a bit? Absolutely, man. We just uh, we just went up to the building and uh, made a little bit of dough for tomorrow, and I got home, so I'm in for the night. Made a little dough to make a little dough. I like it. We hope. <laughs> I don't think you have any problems with that, man. What do you say? I'm sorry. I said I don't think you have any problems with that. Like I, I like we talked the other night. The reception's been pretty dang good so far, and I'm I'm super happy for you guys. Yeah, it's been absolutely insane. Oh. I never would have imagined. <laughs> I bet. No kidding. Like we talked the other night, man. We're coming up on 20 years. A 20th. Hard to believe. 20th high school reunion, dude. What? Hard, yeah, hard to believe. Remember the. Uh, Right after graduation and the you know the the eventful trip we took to Myrtle Beach, man, that's uh, how's that been? 20, <laughs> how's that been twenty years? And we still talk about it today. Like, holy crap! Oh, no. uh, we we did some pretty pretty legendary things. <laughs> I was thinking, still, still a lot of unanswered, unanswered <laughs> mysteries from that trip. Actually, you know what? There's not. It's not going to be unanswered because I'm hoping. I'm ho- I don't know who listens to this, but there's only six of us on that trip, and. That's right. <laughs> I want to, I want the cat out of the bag. We cellophane the toilet, and daggone, somebody <laughs> somebody used it. I know it wasn't me, and Snyder has pleaded and told me that it wasn't him. So <laughs> if, it, if it wasn't you or Wade, it had to be one of the girls. And I, I'm waiting, man. 20 years later, it's time to fess up. Who sat yep. and, and, you know, who got the cellophane? I agree. Are, are, yep, we're, we're past the point. There's no shame in it. <laughs> exactly, man. That was... Uh, what a trip that was with with Matt shaving his chest hair and dyeing his head hair, and oh, uh, God. <laughs> Wade taking a, a stroll out in the ocean and man, what a what a fun trip! And I can't believe that's been twenty years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It took a stroll in the ocean. All the pictures come back like they came off the Titanic. <laughs> Dude, that was so funny, and and to this day we talk about that at least once or twice a year. I'll tell the new story if. If we get introduced to a new friend or whatever, if I'm at Wade's and he's got somebody there that I don't know, it's like we tell that story pretty often, man. And and remember the girls, somebody go get him. Like, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just setting, setting it up for anybody who was listening. We were coming back from a – I think we were coming back from a grocery trip. Is that is that right? We were coming back from the store. Yeah, I think so. And two girls were up front, us four guys were in the back, and Wade just, apparently we were bickering, we were kind of fighting, whatever, and Wade just got fed up, opened the door, we're like, what? He's like, open the door. He gets out, man, and just takes (laughs) off. So, we're like, well, all right, and of course the girls, are you guys, you guys go after him, so here we go, we're we're chasing Wade down the street. Anybody knows Wade, he gets a little thought in his head, and it's it's on, he's going to do whatever Wade wants to do. (laughs) <laughs> right bless his heart oh yeah so dude starts walking yeah. you know he goes on the side of the road where the ocean is obviously we're on the other side we're following you know parallel with him he takes that cut man he takes that cut down towards the water we're like oh man we're gonna have 90 to- degrees 90 <laughs> degrees yep we're like we're gonna have to cut Dead right <laughs> <laughs> right we're gonna have to cut across this street we're gonna have to follow him well he gets down to the beach and we're like okay he's gonna start walking along the beach he says nope I'm walking out in the water, dude. <laughs> right? Dude walked out to waist level before he got parallel with the shore. We're like, Wade, yeah. what are you doing? Middle finger. Wade, get out of the water. Middle finger. <laughs> it was the funniest thing that I, if we could have that on video, dude, that would be to look back on that every year at Christmas or at Thanksgiving, whatever. That's one of the funniest times I can remember. Until he came back to the room. 
and I happened to be sharing a bed with him, and he had like a, a sandcastle in the bed because he had Brought so the much. Beach with him. Oh yeah. my gosh, <laughs> I was so frustrated, but man, that was so much fun. Oh blast, man! Definitely one of the best weeks of my life for sure. <laughs> we had a good time. Remember after that, he's like, I came across some people having sex on the beach. He's like, remember? <laughs> do you remember that story? Like, oh my gosh, yeah. man, so funny, so funny. It was great. But let's uh, let's get let's get something else out of the way here. Uh, you know, c- congratulations. Obviously, is in order for the, the pizza place. We'll talk about that later. But congrats on the 437th straight victory um, from your Buckeyes over the Wolverines. Um, oh God. <laughs> You know, I wasn't going to bring that up. No, no, I, no, I no. Gonna... <laughs> it's, uh, it's, if memory serves right, I think it was 2002, 2000, I think 2002 or 2003. Buddy of mine, uh, was, was off in the Marines or whatever. I hadn't seen him forever. Get a call, yeah. <laughs> get, a, get a call one day in November after Ohio State wins. And I remember picking up the phone already frustrated. I'm like, yeah. And all you had to say was, how about those? And I clicked the phone down. I was like, do you remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I hadn't talked Absolutely. to you. Yeah, that would have been, <laughs> yeah, that been uh, I believe, let's see, fall 2002, maybe. Okay. I hadn't talked to you in or, months. 2002 or 2003. Right. <laughs> I hadn't talked to you in months, and that was the first thing I get. I'm like, you jerk. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, at oh, God. at this point, man, it's calloused. I'm ca- I'm calloused over. It's like um, you, you do. Hey, you got to remember, man. We lived through the Cooper era. Yeah, and, and uh, been there, buddy. I it, can empathize with that. I, I think the thing with me now, obviously, there was no bigger Michigan fan than myself. But even right. even like, I don't know. Probably the last decade, not just because of these mounting losses. Obviously, the far superior program in Columbus. No shame in saying that at all. But I've just found found myself kind of more and more away from it. I think working in Hawaii the last three football seasons, no, heck, the last four football seasons, I don't get to watch the games yeah. live. I have to DVR them. So coming home, it's like I'm just not as into them. It's not the same. It's not. And, yeah. you know, we're, we're 37, 38 years old now, and these kids are 18, 19 years old. And I'm like, man, I want them to win. But if they don't, it, it doesn't affect my day like it used to. You know, it used to, man, day was over. Wasn't going out. Was frustrated. Oh, yeah. You yeah. look. I look back at that. I'm like, why? Like, it, it's it's stupid. And I see, you know, scrolling through Facebook, especially now, I see a fan oh. base. I see a fan base that I'm very concerned, dude. It's like, <laughs> I'm. Con- both sides. <laughs> it's concerning, man. It's like you guys put all your, all your like energy into people you don't know, playing a sport that you probably never played. You know what I mean? Right. And right. yeah. it's it's for for somebody to not give a dang about a whole state, you sure posting about that state quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, dude. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, man. Uh, talking about college football for a little bit, I, I know. It, what a great team in Columbus right now. Like, I think if if. If they don't win the championship, I'm going to be very surprised. They they seem to have all the ingredients. Really good. I really, I really, and as a Michigan fan, it's hard to say, but I really like this coach. I think Day is a heck of a coach. I like his demeanor. Um, mm-hmm. I, I like Tressel. I liked him as a coach. I thought he was a good dude. Uh, Meyer, I couldn't yeah. do. You say what you want. The guy won, but he, he, snake. Yeah. He was he was a snaky dude. Um, but this guy there now, pff, you lose to somebody like that, heck. He, he seems like a good guy, man. I really give him credit for taking over for one of the best coaches of all time and just yeah. continuing it and maybe even having the team playing even better than Urban did, you know? Right. Well, and it's, I think it's with Ryan Day, that's what you get is you get the best of Urban Meyer without the baggage. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, it, Ur- Urban's history, there, there's no secret about you know, the stunt that he pulls at Florida, how you know he's going to leave for health reasons and he's done and all this stuff. And then... You know, not not too long after he takes what everybody believed in in the first place to be his dream job, and you know, as a Buckeye fan, I, you know, of course, I'm excited just because we were in desperate need of a culture change. And as much as I love Jim Tressel at Ohio State, um, I always had the mentality offensively, and of course, you know, having coached middle school football for a little while now, um, I think that's even more solidified in my mind that 
if you're on offense, man, the, the, the pedal's got to be on the gas. Or the foot's got to be on the, on the gas. You can't – Tressel, I didn't, I didn't like the conservatism. I think for, for all the positive things that his mild demeanor brought, I think there was an edge that they were missing. And I kind of compare it to Kobe Bryant without the attitude. I think you know, Tressel had a lot of loaded teams, but they, just, they were never gunslingers. Uh, and they just never had that mentality that when, when it has to get tough, you know, we're going to do what we can to not lose instead of do what we can to win. So I just think when Meyer came in, it was just it was the right time. Um, he inherited a couple good classes, and of course he's a great recruiter anyway. Um, so he was able to set him up for success for a long time. Um, initially, I was I was going to I'm not going to say I was sad to see him go. I was kind of disappointed at how it all ended, but um, you know, knowing what we know now and seeing what Ryan Day's been able to do with that program, um, it's it's really it's it's really panning out. And I agree with you. I think. Uh, they're right up there with anybody in college football right now as, as far as their efficiency and how well they're playing. Um, I think their only weakness at this point is probably the intermediate pass game. I think Michigan exposed that uh, a little bit Saturday. I don't. I didn't get to watch a lot of that game because we were working up at the shop. Um, but from what I understand, that was kind of in, in the first half. Uh, Shea Patterson looked absolutely fantastic, and that's a weakness in Ohio State's linebacker core when it comes to coverage. But other than that, man, they're, they're solid. Chase Young, it's – if there's a more dominant player in college football right now, I'd like to know who it is. And that's that's not me being biased Buckeye fan. That's an objective. <laughs> I mean, this guy is a one-man wrecking crew. And when you see how teams try to attack him and double-team him, and when you've got teams chipping him with – they're double-teaming him and they'll chip him with a tight end and a running back, and he still gets to the quarterback. Um, that's saying something. I mean, and this guy is a dominant, dominant force. Um, sad to see the, the, the situation there where he had to miss a couple of games, but it is what it is, and you know he's back now. So we'll see how it all pans out. Yeah, man, he's he's a beast from what I've seen. And again, over here, I don't see much. By the time I get home from work, games are over for the day. If, if I DVR one, I can catch up on it. But then you have to stay away from spoilers and just what happened and things like that. So I haven't seen him play a lot. But I was happy in the game with, like you said, Michigan came out well with, with their passing game in the first half. But that Ohio State defense made adjustments in the second half and just shut him down. A um, couple key drops by receivers. But to go four for twenty four in the second half, man, that's that's some that's some that's, uh, that's some adjustments. <laughs> Especially, you know, Shea's got three, maybe four, you know, NFL receivers to throw to. Um, mm-hmm. But man, I thought they I thought they uh, held no pun intended because obviously there was a couple missed holding calls on Chase Young. But um, I think they 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 played him pretty well. He he didn't really have a huge impact personally but obviously whenever he's being double teamed that gives somebody else you know the opening to come in right. so him being double teamed obviously created created other holes but um I was happy with that first half but I think that talent gap I think you, you see that and people always say oh man the stars don't matter it doesn't matter if you got a three star look what Wisconsin does yeah but it's not it's not a you know Wisconsin yeah, matters yeah Wisconsin's not a constant you know, threat. Look what Michigan State does. The Antonio takes these three star. Yeah, but look at the program now. He goes through seasons where he wins ten games, but then he goes through two or three seasons where he loses six games. Um, you got you got to you got to be an elite recruiter, man. You just gotta you got to have those four and five stars, and if you don't, it shows up in the big time games. And I think I think that coupled with I think there's such a mental block right now with that game that mm-hmm. it, it's like. It's like uh, Adrian said to Rocky in Rocky Four, man, you can't win. Like, you know what I mean? Every yeah. time I see that, it's like, you guys can't win. I, ex- I don't expect, going into this game anymore, I don't expect a win ever. And, yeah. you know. Gr- <laughs> That's demoralizing. <laughs> it, it is. And it's, I mean, you get, yeah. you get a transfer quarterback coming in. You get a new coach coming in. And you guys hang, you know, half a century up on us. It's like, it, I like Don Brown. I think he's proven that he can be a big time defensive coordinator, but I think he does it against less talented. You know, he does it against the less talented teams. He's exposed when he has to play teams with a, a really good offensive line or a really good, you know, mobile quarterback. So I think I hate to see him go, but I wouldn't be upset with a change there. Um, you know, Harbaugh. I don't know what's. He, he seemed to have got some of that fire back. You've seen him a little bit more animated this game, but for the past two years, he's been kind of, he's been kind of, uh, eh, ho hum on the sidelines. It's like, dude, what's going on? Like, this is where you, this is where you want to be. They want you there forever if you want to be there. But man, you got to step up. Yeah, he beat Notre Dame yeah. this year. Yeah, he beat Michigan State. Yeah, he's beaten Penn State. But 
it's like, dude, you know, this year you lost to Penn State, Wisconsin, and Ohio State. That's three very good programs, but you're and almost dropped one to Army. <laughs> yeah, that there always seems to be a glitch like that in almost everybody's schedule. You know, it's like, oh my God, look, yeah. look, at, look at Clemson. They almost lost to uh-huh. what was it, NC or in, or UNC or NC State, one of those two. Um, yeah, North Carolina. Yeah, everybody seems to have one of those glitches early on. They're they're going through this new offensive coordinator, and it took them six games to really get that in stride. But when they did, I was like, okay, I like the look of this, but mm-hmm. something's got to be done defensively. Whether it's Again, I like Don Brown, but I think maybe it's time for him to, to move on. I heard today that he's possibly a candidate for, like, the Boston College job or um, even as an assistant head coach at Boston College with one of the guys from Ohio State. I can't remember wh- what his name was, but I'm like, you know what? Maybe it's time for him to go get somebody younger, get somebody in there that does things a little bit differently, plays to the talent they have, but you got to recruit better. You, you just got to recruit better. And even if – I mean, Harbaugh's had top ten classes, but – you need top three, top yep. four, top five classes consistently. Um, I yep. think a lot of people don't realize, too, if, if if you're not a Michigan fan, you're probably not watching Michigan games. Well, I watched through the Hoke years, through the Rich Rodriguez years. It set this team back a long time, man. You don't you don't just come in oh, absolutely. And, and switch it. If Harbaugh wins his bowl game, that's four out of five years where he has ten wins. Is mm-hmm. it, you know, he's got no Big Ten titles. He's got no college football, you know, uh, playoff you know, picture it had never been in the picture really, but to do what he did, taking a, a rich team and a you know these teams were losing nine, seven, five, seven. You know they were losing a lot of games and, and kids weren't wanting to come there anymore. So to be able to take over and do what he's did steadily, but man, it's like you got to turn it around. You can't lose five games in a row to your biggest rival, regardless of the of the talent gap. There's got to be adjustments made. That was the most disheartening thing was. After getting 62 or whatever put up on him last year, you know, Don Brown came out and said, man, we've been working. I've been going over this. I've been doing this. been doing that. Well, congrats. You give up 10 less points. I mean, you still right. got – he got murdered. But it's like, dude, again, you can – there's only so much that a coach can do. The player's got to yeah. execute. But I think you got to put him in that position to succeed, and I don't think he's necessarily been doing that against skilled teams like that. Does that, does that make sense? Oh, Absolutely. And it's really when you look at his whole his entire career, at least since I've been super involved in college football uh, and really become such a big fan, even back to his days at Stanford. I mean, there were a lot of good years in, at Stanford where he had solid seasons, um, but when it came down to crunch time, when it was big game time, something something's off with him. And I'm not sure, um, you know, what, what the mentality there is. Um, but I felt like that's when, in the NFL. You know, he lost the Super Bowl to the Ravens um, late and. This, it kind of seems like that's his whole career has been that way. And I just – I almost wonder – I understand Michigan's commitment to him, but at what point is he on the hot seat? Because mm-hmm. um, like you said, you can only you can only have this happen so long before, okay, you've had top ten recruiting classes. We've cycled through assistant coaches. Maybe the problem here <laughs> yeah. is a head coach. And, I, of course, I, I would never wish for anybody to lose his job. Obviously, he's a, he's a great coach and obviously he has a great football mind. Um, but yeah, something's not jiving up there. And I, as much as I dislike Michigan, um, just as a Buckeye fan, it's it's good for the conference if it's successful. Right. And uh, so, uh, so I hate to see anybody drop, especially you know, as I mature in years. And you know, like you were talking about earlier, we don't take it as serious as we used to. Um, but it's it would be nice to see them put together a solid season, and uh, just as long as they don't win that one at the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've had no problems with that the last twenty years, so. Uh... I told <laughs> Bub, Bub and I were talking the other day. I said, Bub, you realize we were in our 20s the last time that uh, Michigan won, and we're knocking on our 40s now. He's like, man, that's that's just sad. Um, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> it is. It's, it's, it's just unbelievable. Like I said, it, I don't put as much emphasis on it. Do I hate it? Yeah. I mean, do I hate the arrogant, self-entitled feeling of 95% of Buckeye fans? I hate it. It, it disgusts me. I work with a guy here. <laughs> I work with a guy here that um, – is, is a huge Buckeye fan, and he's one of those kind of homers, and it's, oh, they never do anything wrong. If they lose, it's somebody else's fault, and yada, yada, yada. It's like, oh, that, yeah. that's the stuff that gets me. It's like, if you get beat, you get beat. It's not, don't blame yeah. this, don't blame that, but just that arrogance, that self, that self, you know what I mean? Um, I guess mm-hmm. it's hard It's hard to see that as, as, you know, as a Buckeye fan, I'm sure, but I talk to Andy Parsons a lot, and you know Andy. We, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, we talk quite a bit about it, and he, 
that's one of his things too. He's like, dude, he'll even say that. He's like, this fan base is terrible. Like he's one of the few. Obviously, you, you know, and you give, you can razz people about how your team's doing. What well, again? It doesn't make a difference to me. I don't have a stake in it. I don't know any of those kids. I don't know their families. Right. I don't, you know, I'm not at practice. I don't call plays. That's not, it's not my job. Um, but man, some some people take it to this, the extreme of wearing F Michigan or F Ohio State shirts, or it's like, dude, like have yeah. some have some class, man. I, it's a game, like, right? I don't that that just arrogance. And there's obviously you see it from both sides. There's a there's a, there's a guy I work with in uh, at well, I won't say where, but there's a guy I work with that's a Michigan fan, and it's kind of the same way. It's always excuses and this and that, and it's like, bro, stop! Don't be that! Don't be that person! You know what I mean? Yeah. I I can't stand athletes like that. It's take the L, man. You got beat. Move on. So what? That's a yep. like Serena Williams. I'm a I'm a I won't say I'm a huge tennis fan, but I I really like tennis, men's tennis more so. I'm a big Roger Federer guy, but yeah, Serena Williams. It, it's kind of like if I'm watching UNC or Duke basketball. Um, if I see them losing, I'll tune in to watch the end just so I can see them lose. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and with her, it's always it, – she never gives credit to the opponent. It's always, I did this wrong. I did this. And, and people like this this lady, if you, if you know much about Serena, like this is the same lady who told a, a chair umpire to sh- that she would shove the effing ball down her effing throat. And people love this lady. It's like yeah, have some – have some class. Like, where where do you draw that line of all oh, is the heat of competition? Was it? Because I've been pretty, you know, I've played sports my whole life, and there's never been a point where I've wanted to shove an effing ball down a umpire's effing throat or anything like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's almost, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, you almost wonder if it's the way they were brought up or just, you know, maybe the culture they're from or something. I don't, I don't know. But I'm like you. I don't have a lot of use for guys that, um, yeah, I'll just throw Michael Irvin's name in there. I was never a fan of Michael Irvin. I thought he was a, you know, cocky, arrogant guy. Just, I was more of the. I loved Jim Tomey when he played baseball because um, mm-hmm. he was just quiet. You know, just come out, bring the lumber, and hit the ball six hundred feet, and and go home, keep his mouth shut. Uh, you know, I'm like you. I, I like these guys that show a little bit of class and know how to have fun and keep it clean. But, but aren't you a Chris Carter guy? <laughs> I did like Chris, but here's the thing about Chris Carter, dude. You, name a receiver that's not a diva. Yeah, I, I get, I get it, I get it. <laughs> dude, dude had the best toe drag. He was just fun to watch. Oh man, not so. He, fun. he could talk trash, man. Not he so fun to listen to. But you, right, but you know, when Randy Moss got there, all of a sudden Chris Carter looked like Mother Teresa. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know your I don't know your opinion. I know obviously growing up a huge Vikings fan, but my opinion, there's never been a better wide receiver in the game than Randy Moss. A hundred percent agree, with the exception of his work ethic and his effort. You realize if that guy didn't take plays off, he probably would have blown Jerry Rice away. And and that's no joke. You could tell if he's not involved in a play. He doesn't come off the line of scrimmage. Right. Yeah, you know, I can re- I can remember watching numerous games where it'd be a run play or a slant to the other side or something, the ball be snapped, and he'd take one step and stand there. And that that was always my problem with Randy Moss. I don't without a without question, as far as, as talent and playing ability, nobody in a, in the history of the game could do what that guy did. Um, as big and lanky as he was, and still be able to move that fast and run routes that crisp, nobody could cover him. I mean, you throw a deep ball downfield. If if you don't double him or chip him somehow, you're not going to cover him. But just the ad, there's a, there's a case again where that attitude is a poison, and and I'm sure that's why the Vikings parted ways with him, and you know eventually he cycled through all these teams, and now he's an analyst, and he seems like he might have you know cleaned up a little bit. But yeah, what could have been if he would have really applied himself every play, every game? Hard to say. You know, it's it's kind of funny because two of the guys, two of the greatest players I've ever seen, one in basketball, one in football, they kind of went that same path. In in my mind, they kind of just disappeared. One, obviously, Randy Moss was one, and Allen Iverson. It was like these guys were the best. Yeah. They were the absolute best, mm-hmm. and then they were just gone. Like, yeah. one day you, you wake up and they've been retired five years, and you're like, well, where'd they go? I forgot they weren't playing. You know what I mean? It's like, why did people not give these guys a chance? But then again, you look at 
you look at their work ethic, you look at their attitude. You, they both come from kind of a, you know, a, a rough background. But again, you make your choices. It's not, it's not my fault if you if you're a thug or if you're, you know, you do things that you shouldn't do. But man, you get out there on that field, you have a once in a lifetime opportunity, a one, you know, one in a million, one in a hundred million, whatever it is, to be a pro athlete, man, and take advantage of it. Do the work, put it in, man. You know how many people want to be in that position, especially when you're the best and you don't do it. Like, you don't put in all the work that you could, and you're still the best. That makes people sick. And Mo, like you said, Moss could have just been – it could have been Moss 1, Rice 2. But now when everybody always thinks of greatest of all time, they always say Jerry Rice. And me seeing more of Moss, you know, being a little bit younger when Rice was playing, even though I was a big 49er fan back in the day whenever I was a kid, um, I still I, – I, I think Moss had more talent. But – yeah. That that work ethic, that that preparation, that was all rice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, and it showed in, in the way they approached the game, and that's, unfortunately, that's becoming a more common tale. Um, you know, you see some of the shenanigans going on in professional sports. Of course, the incident I think it was last week or the week before last. Uh, you know, Pittsburgh Steelers playing the Browns, the whole swinging the helmet at the guy's head, and you got guys trying to kick kick each other in the junk. And I mean, what is going on? <laughs> uh, I mean. Professionals, I can't stress that enough. Right. I mean, which one of us, if I walked into my job and got <laughs> mad at you know, one of my coworkers <laughs> and started throwing haymakers, you know, there'd be charges pressed. Absolutely. And and I just can't, I can't see. I, I don't like this idea where we hold these guys to a different standard. If anything, they should be held to a higher standard. Right. Um, you know, they, they like you said earlier, they've been given an opportunity that you know a million people in the world would kill for. There's athletes lined up you know, all across America coming out of high school just trying to get on a college roster. And these guys were able to, you know, get past that, and now they're in the show. They're making insane amounts of money. If you can't control your emotions and keep yourself in check for a million dollars a year, I don't know what the answer is. Right. You know? They just live in such a different world, I think, man. Whenever they start making that money, it's like the rules don't apply to them. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of above it. Yeah. It's like, yeah. It's like the whole going back to you know like PED use and things like that. I you know these guys are using it, especially baseball. They they pick you know they pick on it more so, and I'm glad they do because obviously baseball is my favorite sport, and I don't want cheaters in there. Um, right. you, you know these guys in, in football, and there's guys in basketball who are getting away with this stuff too. But in, in baseball, man, you got you look at Yasmani Grandal who tested positive a few years back, got a 50 game suspension. Well, guess what? He just signed like a seventy-three million dollar contract over like four or five years. So, what's the incentive? Right. What's the incentive? So what? My name's tarnished a little bit, but pff, my family's set up for life. You know what I mean? Like, yep. still getting paid. And they keep hiring. The owners need to take a stand. We want this out of our game. But if I get a chance to have this guy on my team, I'll do it. Well, that's not how you set that precedent. Look at ESPN with right. Alex Rodriguez. Oh, we want to we want to distance ourselves from from these cheaters and the scandal. Let's hire A-Rod to do our, our Sunday night games. What? I mean, take away the Why? fact – Yeah, take away the fact that he's absolutely putrid. He's awful at his job. He's clearly reading notes all the time whenever he's doing the games. He'll say stuff that makes you just – you have to rewind it and be like, did he – what? Like, what is he even saying? <laughs> like, he, he's terrible. Um, and this guy was a disgrace to the game. What Could have been one of the best, but how long was he using PEDs? You know, yeah. He came up in '94 yeah. and he was a skinny kid, but that don't that doesn't mean he wasn't using him then. You know, look, right. look, these guys just come in and they destroy the game of baseball, which makes me it hurts me because that's what I grew up with, and you know we were both big baseball fans, and even my baseball fan yeah. is kind of not not like it was, and I hate that. But the game has made it that way: outrageous contracts, guys with terrible attitudes, no loyalty. Okay, I'm going to play for you for two years, but then I'm going to sign somewhere else for five years for a hundred million. Right. But I'm only going to honor two years of that contract, so I can take another contract for seven years for two hundred million, but only take you know only take three years of that contract and just keep moving on. It's like man, that with the with the drugs and and all the all the me 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 stuff, and everybody needs attention now. It's like dude, go out, shut up, and play. You know, I can't watch the NBA anymore. Tim Duncan retired. He was my favorite. Of all time, he retired. The game lost me. I'll, I'll turn it on occasionally now, and it's just—it's sickening. It's so hard to watch. Guys taking four or five steps, 
doing this Euro step, doing this step back stuff. I'm like, uh, that's traveling. That's that's traveling. Like that's been traveling since the '60s. Oh, it's re- yeah, blatantly. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah. Of course, I, I never was. I remember when I was a kid, I was such a big Jordan fan, mm-hmm. and the only thing that could pry me away from baseball was watching a Bulls game. And when Jordan left the game, for me, it just kind of—I just could not ever get back into it mm-hmm. um, until Iverson came along. It's funny you mentioned him because he was one of those guys. I, you know, I watched him play a couple times. Like, dude, this guy is special. I mean, it, for as small as he is, being able to do what he does against guys three times his size is is pretty amazing. But yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. I can't stand. I can't turn on an NBA game now. Uh, Alyssa and I, my oldest daughter, watched. Uh, I think it was the. Uh, the first time. Say that. Say uh, that part again. You watched who? The, the Cavs beat the Warriors. Oh, okay, uh, sorry. The time they they won the finals. I watched a little bit of that finals. Oh. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I can't I can't stand the NBA. Um, I'll watch a little bit of college basketball. Um, but yeah, you, you're right. It's the entire sports landscape. You know, back to the baseball thing. I, I try to explain to my kids all the time because Alyssa is a huge baseball fan. Of course, she plays softball, but still watch baseball. Uh, you know, just like I do when I get time to anymore. And, uh, you know, I explained to her, you know, growing up, there was always, that's America's game, man. And there was just, there was always, it was a gentleman's game. It was a class. There was just a, something about it that separated it from everything else. And, you know, I love football, but there's still nothing like baseball, especially live. I said, so, you know, you're watching it and we get into high school and you get the big home run race between you know, Sammy Sosa and uh, Mark McGuire. And then after that, here comes Barry Bonds and he's in, Everybody loves it. Well, then a few years later, I'm like you. It just feels like a piece of your heart's cut out because how many guys do we not know about in that era that tainted the game? Absolutely. And and how many of these numbers and how many of these records and all this stuff that you know blew up the media and got people in the stands and all that? And how many how many of those numbers are really true numbers? Absolutely, man. You know, Sam, I still view Roger Maris as the home run guy. Absolutely. Um, you know, it was. Of course, the game was. Dead. So there's so many. There's so many changes constantly, and that's another thing I don't like. I'm not a big fan of the instant replay stuff going on in baseball now. I think another thing that made baseball special was there was that human element. I hate. And yeah, there's sometimes umpires don't get it right, but yeah. know, that's that's part of the game. And uh, but yeah, the whole Sammy Sosa McGuire thing, and now you know we find out all those guys were using, and then Barry Bonds comes along on top of his steroid use. Um, He's just a disrespectful human being. Mm-hmm. He, uh, yeah, I, I can remember reading stories about him going into spring training, and there'd be fans, you know, lined up trying to talk to him, and get his autograph, and he just kind of, you know, snubs him. And you know, I, I, he, I read an article, I think it was in Sports Illustrated, maybe about he, he did that to a kid, and that's when I just kind of said, I, yeah, this, this isn't for me. I can't deal with these kind of guys. And that's why I just, I, like I said, I gravitated to Jim, Jim Tomey so much because I don't ever remember a time in his career where you ever saw any annex out of that guy. True, that's true. I mean, yeah, I mean he's a, he's a very calm, a very good player. Um, if there was anybody that could have been arrogant, it was this guy. And uh, when he was coming up, you know, he was on a team with Albert Bell and, and some pretty big rock stars in, in the game at the time. But yeah, he just managed to play a long time, uh, had some position changes, and went wherever he was needed. Finished his career. Uh, I can't remember if it was with the Twins or the White Sox. I think it was the White Sox. Um, but yeah, and he eventually wound up in the hall. In, at least, I, correct me if I'm wrong. Did he make the uh, Major League Baseball Hall of Fame? I, I think he was there. I think he was on last year, right? Last year, the year before, I believe. I believe so. He, I believe so. He, um, I know. I know he's in the Cleveland Indians Hall of Fame. They built. They did the big statue thing um, out there for him. I've got that. I still have that recorded on TV, actually. Uh, but yeah, he was such a good guy. I just wish the athletes coming up need to gravitate to guys like that and and try to mimic those guys. And not these other clowns that uh, they clearly just don't have a respect for the game the way they should. That's true, man. That's true. Um, we we grew up. I feel like we were kind of you know. I feel like we were kind of cheated having to watch all the guy. You know, I was a huge Conseco guy growing up. That was my favorite player. And yeah. to see what he became, it's like man, this just isn't. Uh, this isn't you know. This isn't what I. This isn't what I remember. You know what I mean? The, these guys all become, like you said, all become cheaters. I was a huge Conseco guy. Dad was a McGuire guy. 
Canseco, to me, you know, he wrote these books. He became kind of like a laughing stock. Um, do I think he was kind of blackballed? I, I kind of do at the time because, you know, he comes out with these books. He's naming names in these books. It's funny that he names yep. he names these names and all these people deny it. Yet nobody sues him for defamation of character. Uh, people right. that people that were in there, it comes out later on that oh pa- oh Palmero, yeah you you did. Um, uh-huh. And for so long, people praised people praised McGuire while they were crapping on Canseco. And I'm like, wait a minute, guys, look at the body types. They play together. Like, do you think one did it, not the other? Not saying that's Right. Always how it goes, you know, but because because Tome played with Manny Ramirez. Do I think Tome did it because Ramirez? No, I don't. But there's a pretty good chance that you're in that locker room in 1987, 88, 89 in Oakland. You're seeing Canseco get massive doing what he's doing. You're right there with him. You know what I mean? And even Tony Larusa came yeah. out. Larusa came out and criticized Canseco and talked bad about him while praising McGuire. And then it comes out McGuire. Yeah, I did take him. Of course you did. And he does it for an inter- interview for like 60 minutes where he's crying. It's like, shut up, dude. Like, you know you did it. You know you cheated. All that phony stuff that you did with the Maris family when you hit the home run and you ran over to the family and you hugged him. It's all a bunch of crap. It's all a bunch of lies. And you should be ashamed of yourself for yeah. the rest of your life. So what happens after he does that? They hire him to be a hitting coach. So he's still in Major League sure. Baseball. It's like, you guys, just this makes no sense to me. And not to lop it all, McGuire, because I think... Overall, he seemed like a pretty good dude, but again, dude, you yeah. you cheated the game, man. You cheated the game. You mm-hmm. didn't play. That's one thing I will say. In guys like, I always tell the story of how big an a hole Pete Rose is. I I can't stand Pete Rose. I don't think Pete should ever be in the Hall of Fame. That's a whole other soapbox I can get on later. But he played <laughs> he played the game the right way. He hustled. He gave everything he had. Um, I wish more guys did that today. But again, today, man, back then they're playing for contracts every year. You know, oh, hey, you you got one-year contracts. I think that's how it should be. You play for a one- or two-year deal. You prove you're good enough. You prove you're healthy enough. You prove you're not going to get hurt. Nowadays, it's all, oh, man, we're going to sign you, Joey Votto, to a 10-year, $221 million deal or whatever it was. And now look at those. Mm -hmm. uh, Votto had some good years, but look at the last three or four years. He's been in a steady decline. You know, since his father passed away, he's kind of went – there's some mental issues going on there. Something has kind of made this guy decline a little bit, and now you're looking at it going, man, the Reds won't sign anybody. Well, they can't because they're stuck with the contract that they probably should have never right. signed in the first place. Same with Devin Mezzarocco. They signed this guy to a huge deal, and he's not even with the team anymore. I don't I don't right. think. Um, I don't think so. It's like make better, you know, make better choices. But back to Pete. Pete did things the right way. He just made that mistake, man. He – there's one, you know, that one rule you cannot bet on baseball, and you did it. Now you got to live with the consequences. Yeah. You know, people always want to talk about, well, now they're letting these guys. Well, you can't compare. It's not comparable. I'm not. You know what I mean? You can't. You can't compare that. You yeah. you broke the rule. That's like if I'm driving down the highway and it says 65, and I go 70, and they pull me over and they give me a ticket. I can't say, but that guy was going 80. It's dude, you were break. You broke the. You broke the law. Like you can't do it. You yeah. you accepted your ban. You said for years that you didn't do you didn't do wrong, and then you come out with a book saying, "Oh yeah, I did." Like when you can profit off of it, when you profit off your lies, it's, it changes a little bit. Same thing yeah. that McGuire did with that interview, and but guys like that, I wish I would have grown up. As far as I'm glad I didn't, because then I'd be 60 years old. But I wish I could have grown up and <laughs> and watched the guys of the 50s and the 60s. Man, just a pure. A pure game. Were there flaws then too? Guys taking greenies and and yeah, guys took greenies. That's the same as drinking a Red Bull now. Like you know what I mean? It's yeah. the PED thing, dude. When you're putting 25, 30, 40 feet on a fly ball, I remember remember reading one time an article about Bonds, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think in one year he he hit. I'm trying to think what his he hit like one ball over like 425 feet. In like I don't know 1999 or 1998 or something, and then like a couple years later, he hit like 35 or 40 balls over that mark. Um, so the balls that were were going 390 feet to the wall are now 440 feet deep in the seats. You know, it's like of course it yeah. makes it. Of course you're not going to be in the pros if you don't have the hand eye coordination if you're not a good hitter, but it makes a difference. People all oh, don't make a it difference. Matters. Steroid doesn't help. Well, then why are they doing them? If it doesn't help, why are they yeah. doing them? Of course it helps. 
don't don't be right. you know what? right why are, they, why are they risking the chance of the penalty and, and the fines and everything that comes with it if it doesn't it absolutely helps yeah you're yeah. absolutely right but nowadays you're you're rewarded man you're rewarded for that kind of thing it's it's hey ah oh, you'll get you look at Nelson Cruz Nelson Cruz got busted mm-hmm. a couple years ago now I think he's hit the most home runs over in baseball over like the last four or five years. And people, they're giving him big yeah. contracts. It's like, oh, my God, you guys, you, you don't care. Like, the, the mistakes that turn people away from baseball are the mistakes you continue to make until football's overtaken it, you know? Football's America's game. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, there's no way around yep. that. People people tune in. More people tune in for those 16 games a year plus the playoffs than they will for baseball, man. Yep. It's, just a, it's just a fact, you know? Yeah, and I, I think it, uh, a lot of it probably has to do with the fact that Major League Baseball, the administration can say what they want to say, but they don't really want it to stop. Because if they want it to stop, they have the ability to make it stop. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's like you said, you know, stop, stop rewarding guys, and let's make penalties that matter. Absolutely. You know, let's say, if for, first offense, let's kick you out of the game for two years. Right. And then, and then if you come back and do it again, you're gone. Exactly. And, and we'll slap stuff. Yeah, we'll slap something on you like Pete Rose got. You know, you start making consequences that matter, and you'll get the results that you want. But you know, the way Major League Baseball does it is, it's it's kind of, of course, <laughs> if you rewind back to the whole congressional hearings with you know McGuire and Palmero and all those guys. Of course, anything Congress is involved in is a circus. <laughs> um, right. Not not to get into that whole thing, but you rewind back to all that, and I think I've always felt like since then Major League Baseball was doing just enough to appease the dogs from coming after them, and no more. They still want guys to get away with it, but they want to make it look like and present like, oh, we're really trying to clean this up. Well, no, it's time to crap or get off the pot, clean it up. If you want to clean it up, clean it up. Absolutely. You have the ability to clean it up, so let's impose some stuff that matters. And I think what they did this year with, if you watched much at all, I think using these juiced balls this year was absolutely ridiculous. All these teams setting setting all these records – um, it, it just all of a sudden, everybody's hitting home runs. It's like you guys got to go back to the old balls. You, you're using these new ones that are that are hyped up, juiced up. I think they go back to the to the old ones next year. If not, I mean, it's getting it's getting pretty out of hand. You know, when we were kids, if you had a, a four four and a half ERA, you're done. You're you know you're you're getting released. You're getting traded. Now that's good. Your ace has a four four and a half ERA. You know. These guys, it, it's yeah, that, that used to be unheard of. <laughs> it, it, it's unreal. It's all about offense. They're setting strikeout records, um, and like you said about the replay, I'm firmly against it. I hate it. I don't think it should be used yeah. in any sense. Um, it's uh, you need that human error. You need that human element. And now, same with football, it's going on all every all pass interferences can be challenged. This can be challenged. What's next? Holding because you can call holding on every mm-hmm. play. So now we're going to challenge every yeah. play. No, man. If, if Stop messing with stuff that works. I mean, I know there's ways to make things better. People complain about baseball and, oh, it takes too long. It's boring. Well, you're probably watching the wrong thing. If, if you think it's mm-hmm. boring, if you think it's boring, then you've, you, know, you don't understand the game. You can't play the game. Right. Um, so that's cool. It's not for you. That's fine. Go on to watch football with the you know, quickness and all that stuff. That's, that's cool. But, you know, football's got commercials every nine seconds. They got people challenging yep. this. They got instant replays. It's taking forever, so you can't use that argument with baseball anymore. That, oh, it just takes forever. And like, dude, that's what it was meant to be. Look at the old days. Look in the stands at a baseball game. It was an event. People, you know, the guys, yep. the, the women coming in dresses, the guys in their in their suits and their top hats and their ties, presidents being at yep. games. It's like this stuff was an event, and it's just turned now into just this spectacle of. It's just money. It's that it's it's went away from everything yep. that made it great. But I guess you can say that pretty much about everything, you know, movies, music, sports, all that stuff now it's money, money, money and it's it's really sad cuz it's really made my love for a lot of that stuff just dissipate to a point of, eh, okay, you know? And I hate yeah, it. Why cause bother? Cuz I I love I love watching it. I love I love watching the Cubs play. I love watching I love watching baseball, but Man, it's, it's not the game we grew up with, and even looking back, no. that's not the game we thought it was with all the all the you know PEDs running rampant and things like that. But I just miss Don, Don Mattingly and Dale Murphy and you know I, Tony Gwynn and Wade Boggs. I miss those guys. Those guys that you could look at and be like, oh, man, these guys know how to play the game. 
they play it the, they play it the right way. It, it, we're some you know Wade Boggs. I heard the you know you've heard the stories over the years of Boggs was he liked to drink and party a little bit. Yeah, that's off the field stuff, man. Uh, whatever, you know. If if this is a morality game, then you ain't gonna have five teams. Um, right. <laughs> y- y- you know so. But I miss yeah. I miss the way those guys played, and I'm not sure how we got down this path about about sports, but uh, I'm glad we talked a little bit about it. I know. You know, growing up, you being a, a big Twins fan, and we were always like, "Dude, the Twins!" And then early '90s, yeah. dude, you got that was kind of your that was kind of your peak right there. Twins and Braves, and had some really good teams back then. I know your dad was a huge fan. I, I definitely wanted to bring him up in this and uh, just say what a yeah. good, what a good dude he was, man. And it sucks that that he's gone, but uh, I just wanted to you know just want to say a little something about yeah, him and, and let you know how I thought of him. I thought he was a really a really good guy. I think a lot of your family, and I hated to hear that your uncle had passed there the other day when we tried to do this the first time. So just wanted to yeah. kind of give a shout out to those guys and, and uh, definitely thinking about you and your family. I appreciate that, man. Yeah. That was, that was my dad's youngest brother that passed. Uh, that was actually, that actually happened the evening of my birthday. Uh, very, very weird day. Of course, we, that was one of the first days that we tried to do a trial run up the, the pizza place there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're all excited, having a good time. And then mom came in there late. Of course, I was trying to close out the register. I had just told Amanda, um, but I got to get home. I got to get, uh, Brent's going to be calling me here in a little bit. We're going to do this podcast. And then mom came in and she told me to go get my brother who was working in the back and went and got him. And I could, I could tell by the look on her face that, you know, whatever she had to say wasn't going to be good. And yeah, she told me Uncle Phil had passed. Uh, that came after about a two and a half, three year battle with lung cancer, uh, numerous rounds of chemo. And it just got to the point where, uh, the chemo was taking too much of a toll on him and he had to stop. And then there were some complications with pneumonia. And he just didn't come out of it. But uh, yeah, I appreciate you bringing those guys up, man. Of course, Dad was. Uh, that, that took a while for me to get over that one. Um, anybody that has never has never dealt with the loss of a parent, I, I, there's no really way to describe it. I know it, it changed me. Um, I hope you know years down the road we can say it changed me for the better. But I know I'm not the same guy without my dad here. Um, but at the same time, I'm not the guy I am without my dad being in my life. And I was so blessed. Yeah, such a, such a great set of parents, man. I I can't say enough, and I think you're in the same boat. I was you know hold your parents and still do in such a high regard. Uh, just, you'll never meet nicer people, and uh, you know being raised by good parents, I think it says a lot. Of, if I accomplish anything in my life, I want people to look back and say, well, it's because he had a good mom and a good dad that cared for him and loved him. And you know, so I, I can't say enough about that and the import and the importance of family um, and and the role it can play, good or bad. Uh, and, but I was very blessed, and uh, yeah, I appreciate you bringing those guys up, man. Dad, Dad's missed every day, but uh, I'm to the point now where I can talk about Dad, and the memories are good, mm-hmm. and uh, most of the stuff I, you know, I can laugh about. And that's that's one of the things I miss most about my dad. Is man, nobody laughed like him. Uh, we would sit around and just he had such a dry sense of humor. Mm, I and we, we would just yeah, well, <laughs> there was never a time when we wouldn't get together and we wouldn't laugh about something. So <laughs> you know, there's, you're always going to have the days, you know, birthdays and family dinners and. Uh, there's certain times of the year veterans day was always a big thing for him so you know they, those days will always feel a little bit empty uh but I'm, I'm so blessed i would rather uh be thankful for the time that i had and the good memories than i would to, to sulk about uh the fact i've never seen him again so uh you know, of course you know, the me being a christian i believe someday i will but right. that's that might be a conversation for another time but uh, yeah it, it is what it is man and that's life and we're unfortunately we're getting into the age where we're gonna have to start dealing with that stuff and um, I, I think we're kind of naive and arrogant if we think we can avoid it. <laughs> I know, man. It's just, it's just a fact of life. But, you know, I'm always one of these guys that tries to see the, the silver lining and everything. And you can you can allow things to tear you down or, or find a way to, to use it as fuel and build you and make you a better human being. And that's just kind of the route that I've taken, uh, you know, with missing my dad. Of course, now my Uncle Phil is, uh, you know, I want to be somebody that they would be proud of. Um, I believe my dad lived a life that was, you know, to the best of my knowledge, ethical. I'm um, always trying to, to treat people the way he wanted to be treated and, and fight for the little guy. So, you know, that, that's the kind of guy I want to be. And, you know, sometimes that might not come across the way I want it to, but, uh, you know, like I said, hopefully, you know, years down the road, I can be remembered the same way he is. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with all of it. Right, man. Well, he's, uh, he's proud of you for sure, and he was, man, because, like, you're a good dude. I always talk, you know, I always talk highly of you. I have a few really good friends that, that I know I could count on for anything, um, you yeah. know, with Bub and Wade and my buddy Josh Hollis and and uh, you, you're you're 
obviously you're right there, man. We've known each other a long time, and I really, I really think highly of you. And that's one thing I, I like you said, we're at that age where unfortunately things like that are going to happen, and uh, I don't know that I could deal with it if that happened to me now. I don't, I, I don't, I, I hope that I could deal with it, you know, the way you have. But man, it's definitely something I do not look forward to. Um, I know I was over here. I started my first contract here uh, in 2016, and my, I believe my third day of work here, my grandmother died. Um, and you know, we Whoa. were we were close. You know, she she helped raise me for 30 years, and she lived next door, and she was always there. And like you said, you just take for granted that you're gonna pull in the driveway, and she's gonna be looking out the window, or you're gonna pull in the driveway, and you can peek in her window, and she's gonna be standing at the kitchen sink, and um, it was weird, you know, going home that first time and, and that trailer being empty and looking in that window and no one being there, looking at her chair and her not being there. And but like you said, you yeah. got all those good memories of, man, she, she makes you laugh. She, you know, you, you can look back on things that she did or things she said or things she taught you. And you're like, wow, she was, she was a good person. It's really, it's really good to have those. It's like you said, it's part of life and it's, that's the suckiest part of life is, is, is death. But man. You have those memories and you keep those with you and, and hopefully you can, I mean, as humans, that's how we're, that's how we're, we're wired to hopefully, you know, to, to continue on and get past that. But man, that's, that's something that I just, yeah, I, I don't even like to think about it. Um, yeah. Death is something that for a long time, like I never had panic attacks in my life. I never had anxiety. I don't, that's, that's something that doesn't really, I don't get that, but there would be times where I would be lying in bed at night when I was younger, man, and think about dying and just like, like I couldn't breathe. Like that's the closest thing to a panic attack that I could ever remember feeling and being like, dude, in my head, it was just like, when you're gone, like you're gone. Like it's like forever, like forever, forever, forever. You know what I mean? And that would just run in my head and in my head and I would have to get up and I'd be like, dude, just settle down, just calm down. But it would always be at night, you know, when your mind races at night anyway. Um, But I think, again, like you said, I think as we get older and with our beliefs, it's like it's not over. You know, once you once you die, you're just you're just gone here. You're gone here, but you continue on and you're going to see those loved ones. But uh, it doesn't make it any easier to think about, you know. No. And and in hindsight, I think, um, yeah, there was a there was a fellow around here. Of course, you and I know him. I won't bring his name into this, but. uh, you know, a guy I considered a friend, didn't know him real well, but uh, his dad recently passed away. And uh, I reached out to him maybe about a week after his funeral. And, and I told him, man, I said, man, I said, look, I said, I know you probably got 100 people uh, you know, trying to tell you if you need anything or just need somebody to talk to, I'm here for you or whatever. But uh, I said, I want you to know you can call on me anytime because I know I've been where you're at. And uh, in, in hindsight, I think where I failed uh, is how I dealt with it initially, of course, trying to be the, the tough guy, you know, the Marine just, okay, this is part of life. Just get back to work and deal with it. I can't stress enough the importance of letting grief run its process. Mm-hmm. Um, because there was a lot of, of course, the way, with my dad, the way my dad passed was so sudden. Um, you know, he and I had a conversation on Sunday. I uh, went to work. Uh, I think I actually talked to him on the phone on maybe Monday or Tuesday. Tuesday evening, um, he and my mom and my sister went out to eat at the truck stop and he said he wasn't feeling real well and was having trouble walking, uh, getting to the car. Um, wound up Wednesday morning. My sister comes, gets me up out of bed at six o'clock in the morning. Said they're taking dad to the hospital. He had a heart attack. Of course, she's freaking out. I'm, you know, I'm trying to be calm. Okay, well, you know, heart attack isn't necessarily a death sentence. You know, how's he doing? Well, he's he's awake and he's talking, and they think we got him stable. Okay, well, let's just wait and see what happens. Well, all day Wednesday, um, he improves. Uh, they thought he was bleeding internally somewhere, so. Uh, they gave him a couple pints of blood. His blood pressure was improving. Uh, his kidney function was still a little rough. But uh, Thursday morning, uh, I went to work, uh, took a half day off. So Thursday afternoon, about noon, I went back up to Riverside where they had him. And his doctors were all talking about, uh, you know, we're going to keep him up here one more day. Things are looking good. We're going to move him down. Uh, I think it was like to the second floor or something, uh, just to monitor him for about a week. And then he should be back to work and ready to go. So we all thought everything was great. Uh, we talked, he called the kids, FaceTimed the kids, uh, got to talk to them. 6.30, I gave him a kiss on the forehead, said, Dad, I'll be up here tomorrow. Uh, Heather's going to stay with you tomorrow. I'll stay with you Saturday night. Mom will be up here tonight, and we'll see you later. I love you. And I left, and that was the last time I talked to my dad conscious. So it just it happened that quick. Um, 
you know, long story short, there were some complications with the blood thinner he was taking that uh, didn't go well with type 2 diabetes, which he had, uh, caused some internal bleeding. They couldn't find it. Uh, his heart didn't have enough blood in it to pump on its own, and, and that's kind of what ultimately resulted in the end. But, uh, yeah, being that fast, I can remember coming out of the hospital room um, after he passed, and it's kind of, there's the shock of it where you just collapse on the floor, and you're like, did that, you know, did that really just happen? And it's, you're crying, but it's more of a reflex. You're not really feeling it yet. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, as, as the days wear on and things get busy, you're planning a funeral and you got family and friends coming around and you, know, you, you got that support group and you, you feel like, okay, I can really do this. I can get through this. And you know, once all that's done, you go back to work and you just keep plugging. And I never really let myself just, just really process. It's okay to hurt over this. It's okay for you to miss your dad. It's okay for you to acknowledge that a piece of you is now gone. And that hole's always going to be there. There's never going to be normal the way you knew it is never going to be normal again. You have to be willing to adjust to a new normal. Um, and I just never really let that happen. It took me a long time. There was that that Christmas season was especially hard. And it wasn't because of the holidays. It was just I think I had a little bit more downtime. We weren't as busy at work, and it just I couldn't run from it anymore, you know. So I really had to get through that and, and, and process all that. But. Yeah, grief, grief is a funny thing, man. Of course, they say there's stages to it, and I don't know all of them, but I know, you know there's denial and anger and all this stuff. And, and I don't think if you don't face all that, and if you're not honest with yourself in all of that, um, I think you're probably doing more harm than good, really. Uh, but those, those are some of the lessons I learned, you know, just, just dealing with the loss of dad. And now it's come full circle, and like I said, it, it's all good, and I can talk about him and, and laugh and, and love the time we had together. And, I, yeah, I still miss him. There's still days. There's a couple days the other a few months ago, actually, I came home from work, and I don't even remember specifically what it was, but something just you know reminded me of him. I've been thinking about him all day, and I came home, and I just sat down in, in our living room. Uh, we got a big chair in our living room. I sat down, and uh, Amanda could tell something was wrong. She said, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. And I said, I just missed my dad, and I just started crying, and that, that's been three years. So you, you just have those days, and you know they come and go, but for the majority of it, you know, I still I still think about my dad every day. There's not a day goes by that he doesn't cross my mind. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I believe, you know, if, if anything in the Bible is true, and of course, I haven't necessarily been the model Christian lately, but, you know, if, if I believe in God and, and what he says in the Bible, that, you know, someday if, if I'm faithful and, and uh, the Lord is what it is, that I'll see him again and, and we'll, be, we'll be able to rejoice then. Right, man. That's a good way to look at it. That's how, you know, that's how I was brought up as well. So, and that's one good thing with mom and dad. They're both at that place where, hey, if, you know, it, when it happens or if it happens, you know, it's, uh, well, not if, obviously it's going to happen, but, you know, we're both, we're both uh, pretty sure of where we're going. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a, 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 you know, it's a good thing. You know, it's, it's it sucks for the people here on, you know, that's left on, on this, you know, on, on earth, obviously, but for, for those who believe, hey man, it's, you know, we can't wait for you to come up next. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it, it's hard for our, our, you know, P, P minds to, to comprehend that kind of thing and be like, what? And obviously you're always going to question things like that. And, and, uh, you know, I have, obviously I have some buddies who are totally against that thing and don't believe. And that's, you know, that's their right too. And, and, but I heard a guy say once, if, you know, if, if I believe and I'm wrong, then what did that cost me? But if you don't, but if you don't believe and you're wrong, that cost you eternity. You know what I mean? It's like, right. So man, I mean, it's, I don't know, but again, back to your father, dude, good, great guy, um, and he's definitely missed, um, but I'm, I'm glad we got to, to talk about him a little bit, and uh, yeah, just great family, dude, you guys have always been, always been really supportive of me, and always been super nice to me, I, I talk to your mom occasionally on, you know, Facebook, she'll post something here or there, but um, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. man, it's a, it's a, it's an hour into this, dude, we've been talking for an hour, so um, let's... Well, man, we got- 15 years or so to get <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be the longest episode of i know man dude i have so many stories the the uh jogging through town stories after monday nitro the um throwing eggs on our senior trip the, you know there's just so many matt oh, yeah. matt of course i have to bring up matt stealing second with the bases loaded um that's <laughs> that's still probably yeah, my we gotta, we gotta get that out, out of the way i knew that was gonna be fun <laughs> all right so what are we in we're in the seventh or eighth grade at the time we're playing for uh wellston blue i believe was our our pony league team um uh, just right before yes. ba- right Should before seventh grade yeah 
Yeah, and I actually, funny thing, I still I still have that shirt from that year, and I wear it to sleep in. Uh, so 1994, 1995-ish, I still have that shirt. It's actually with yeah. me. It's actually with me right now. It's, it's It looks like Swiss cheese. It's so bad. Uh, my mom wanted to take it a few years ago, and she was going to do one of those things where they make quilts out of like your old T-shirts, all my old ball shirts. And she's like, hey, uh, where's that? She tried to hide that shirt from me. I'm like, nope, sorry. Like that's yeah. uh, we. I'd actually made a uh, made a little pact with uh, I think it was Andy Mercer and Bub uh, and myself. Obviously, we were gonna we were all gonna wear those when we got married. Well, I I can't. I think Andy wore his. I think I don't think one of the two forgot it. I think Andy wore his. I think Bub forgot to wear his. And clearly, you know, I'm gonna be single forever, which is cool. But I still have my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I still have my shirt, so I'm okay with that. Um, but so anyway, we're we're I can't remember who we're playing. I can't remember all the details of the game. I just remember the bases are chucked, man. We got guys on first, second, and third. We're about to have a big inning. Matt's on first. He's ready to go. All of a sudden, Matt takes off for second base. Matt, what what are you doing? And then whoever was on third, I believe, took off because they're like, "What's this guy doing?" So they got, I think they got in a rundown and they got tagged out, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so yeah, Matt tries to steal second with the bases loaded. And my dad, being the coach, you know, he was, you know, he's a, a, a pretty, he was a dictator out there, wasn't he? He was always hard on everybody, right? Um, oh yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you you knew he wasn't gonna get mad, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. He just looked at you and said, "Buddy, what what are you doing?" <laughs> That's exactly what he did. <laughs> it's like if that didn't make that guy mad, I don't think you could make him mad. <laughs> Dude, no. I, I did because I, I can remember looking back at first base and just kind of shrugging my shoulders, like I don't know. <laughs> Running. <laughs> That's it. We're going to try something new. We're going to try to steal with the bases loaded and catch everybody off guard. Like, what the heck is Matt doing oh, out goodness. there? I always think about that. Well, I, it, go ahead. No, if I remember right, I don't think the pitcher had even delivered yet. Like, I, I think I tried to get a jump before he even <laughs> went into the windup. Because I can remember him, I can remember when everybody started, like, all the pieces started moving. Uh, if I remember, I think uh, Timmy Lambert might have been on second base, and Travis <laughs> Tilly was on third. Dude, there were yeah, no pe- Tilly. You were the only piece that was moving, man. <laughs> there was nobody yeah. else moving. <laughs> Eventually, it had you. But I can remember the pitcher just standing there with the ball, kind of looking around like he, he was cocked back, ready to throw somewhere, <laughs> but he wasn't sure where to. Go. <laughs> it was complete chaos. <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. I was I was pitching in a high school game once. I think it was against Federal Hawking, maybe. And uh, I think I've told this story before, but, of course, Eberts was our first baseman. Um, I'm on the mound. I, 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 you know, do my pickoff move. I throw it to Jake, and Jake looks at me like, what are you doing? There was nobody on first. There was no – I tried to pick a guy off first, and there was nobody there. He was on second. I'm like, what just happened? You talk about, a, you know, a, a brain fart, um, which should have been yeah. a balk. You know, it should have been a balk. <laughs> But I was like, no, I stepped off first, and after the, you know, after their coach came out, I was like, dude, that's a balk. This should, this should be, you know, whatever. And uh, I kind of weaseled my way out of it. I'm like, no, I stepped off, and the ump was like, yeah, you stepped back first, which that was kind of my move, is I would kind of try to step, you know, step back before I threw over. But uh, just, yeah, just a brain fart. But that's one of my favorite Peterson stories, and I always have to tell that one. <laughs> that's gonna be, that's gonna be my addition one day to. Uh, to <laughs> to the Peterson family, I'm gonna I'm gonna have that all typed out in some neat font. I'm gonna have pictures of you from back then, and I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna make that out to you guys. I remember that, and I remember Matt's uh, 35 foot hook shot in uh, in basketball. Um, oh yeah, yeah, behind the three point line. That was that. Those were my fa- those are my two two favorite Matt Peterson um, uh, athlete uh, sports stories. Those are my faves for sure. <laughs> but yeah, I, that, I know, right? <laughs> So man, again, we're an hour in. Uh, let's get into your new venture, dude. What? Uh, tell us a little bit about the new the new Rocket Pizza. Tell us a little bit about like what brought it on. When did you guys start thinking about this? Uh, when did you know for sure, like, hey, this is you know this is what we're gonna do? Um, and to mention before that, Jeremy Smith, and Nathan Mullahan are, are obviously partners with you. Anybody else that's kind of partners with you guys, or is it just you three? Nope, it's just three of us. Um... To, to get back kind of the beginning, you just gotta gotta rewind a little ways. Of course, um, I've always been 
you know, my career is, is in finance. I've been a banker now for you know, going on 16 years. Started from the ground up, man. Started as a teller. Um, I just kind of worked my way up. Um, work for a very good company now. Um, I'm not sure what their policy is. I won't bring their name into it, but <laughs> anybody that knows me knows. Um, have a great job on the financial analyst. I underwrite commercial loans now. So, um, you know, the more I've learned about business um, and finance, I've always just kind of kind of wanted to be an entrepreneur in a, in a certain sense and never, you know, I've, I've explored some different things and uh, just none of them ever really panned out. I never felt like it was worth the risk. I'm not a huge risk taker usually. Um, so I just, you know, none of that ever really came to fruition. Uh, I met Nathan uh, back, he started going to church with us, I think it was in 02 or 03. Uh, so I've known Nathan and him, been real good friends for, you know, almost 20 years now. Um, and I, it was just a few years ago, uh, you know, we're sitting around a fire out at his house one night. And he said, man, it'd be cool. Of course, both of us love pizza, especially Nathan. That, that guy eats more pizza than anybody <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. Um, and I'm not kidding. I mean, three or four times a week, this guy's ordering from somewhere. Right. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sitting around and we were, we were talking about food and I had been to a, uh, a brick oven pizza place. And I was telling him, man, if you've never had wood fired pizza or coal fired pizza in a brick oven, man, there's just nothing like it. Mm-hmm. And he said, man, it'd be cool to open a pizza place someday. I said, yeah, I said, that'd be pretty neat. Um, so we just, you know, we, we talk about it here and there. Well, he was on his way home from Columbus in, um, uh, I believe it was 2014, maybe. And he stopped in Asheville, uh, which is just above Circleville there. Uh, and ran into this place called Mike's Pizza and, and got a pizza to go. And he said he took a bite of it. And he said, as soon as he bit into it, he said, that's rocket pizza. He said, that's the old rocket pizza that used to be in Wellston back in the eighties and left in the nineties. And, uh, he came back and told me about it. And, of course, I can remember a little bit about Rocket Pizza. I can remember eating there. Uh, didn't really remember a whole lot about what it tasted like. Uh, but, of course, he was raving about it. He said, man, you're not going to believe this. And, uh, he said, i we, I got to find a way to, to figure out what that recipe is because I'd like to make that. So uh, he, he eventually found out that it was Mike Roof. Uh, if I get my story straight, it's the first guy that started Rocket Pizza originally in Wellston. Um, and Mike still had it. It's hence Mike's Pizza. Um, and he wound up getting a hold of Mike and talked to Mike and tried to talk Mike into giving him a recipe or selling it to him. Mike wouldn't do it. Uh, well, eventually Mike turned the restaurant over to um, a lady named Christy, and I'm not sure if she's a relation of his or not. Uh, but Nathan worked on her for a couple of years, and finally, just out of the blue, calls me one day uh, and says, man, he said, I, I think I got Christy to agree to sell us this recipe. I mean, we hadn't even really seriously talked about opening a business or, or doing anything that in-depth. Um, but I, I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, we haven't talked about a price yet, but he said, uh, he's willing to meet with us if you want to come up there uh, you know, next week sometime. So we did. Um, went up and talked to her. She agreed to sell us the recipe for a very reasonable price, no no questions asked. Um, so we, we talked to her. He said, we, we kind of told her, well, let's, let's go back and we'll talk about it, talk to our families, uh, see what they think. And, you know, me and Nathan talked about it, and Nathan says, well, you know, what about – Jeremy's always kind of been an entrepreneur and mining kind of guy. What about bringing him on? Of course, we're all really close friends. Um, you know, these guys are a lot like me and me and you are me growing up. Not very many people I trust, man. I got a small circle for a reason. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so they're, they're guys I trust. So I said, yeah, you know, if, he, if he's willing to do it, we can pull it off. So that's when uh, – in February 2017, uh, we go up, make the deal official. Uh, buy the recipe. We got Facebook page. Throw just on the way home. We threw this Facebook page up, just posted some pictures of us making pizza, and the response right off the rip was just absolutely incredible. I think um, Jeremy put that Facebook page up on the way home in you know, maybe ten minutes. That was like ten thirty at night. By seven thirty the next morning, we had over fifteen hundred likes, and the post had already reached like fifteen thousand people. Wow. Um, within. Se- yeah, within seven days, uh, I think it had over 55,000 reaches and like 10,000 likes or something. I mean, it's, just, it's crazy the response about, man, is this for real? Is, is Rocket Pizza really coming back? So you know, we started really working on a project in, in 2017, uh, a lot of planning. Because, uh, you know, of course, I told these guys from my experience in finances, this is a risky business. There's, there's got to be a lot that goes into it. We've got to really look at the numbers and and do a lot of research and make sure when we do a cost model and forecast and all this stuff that it makes sense that we're not just pulling numbers out of a hat. So, you know, Jeremy reached out to some of his contacts and uh, there's, there's a guy that just moved back to Wilson that has some background in, in pizza that met with us and he was able to give us some figures for, from some, uh, some stores that he owned 
that were in similar demographic areas to Wellston, similar population, that kind of thing. So uh, we were just kind of using all the resources we could to really to really make sure it was going to be worth it. Um, and then and then from there, it was just all about pulling the trigger. So we started exploring locations, uh, approached a couple of financial institutions for financing. Um, so this was a long, drawn-out process. So we actually were able to close on our first loan and buy our, our current location with three adjacent vacant lots. Um, we closed on that loan December December 31st of 2018. Um, yeah, so, so that would be right. So we, we didn't actually move on this thing for you know, almost two years. Um, we had some hiccups early on after we got into the demo, uh, got our second gap financing in June, and that's really when the work started. So pretty much 99% of the time since June, I've been either working at my job or working on this building. <laughs> wow. So now, now we're finally, yeah, fast forward, we're finally ready to, uh, we've done a, a trial run the last week and a half or so that uh, we're going to do this week. We're really trying hard uh, to get full open, have our dining room open, everything by Saturday. Uh, but it's just there's so much because we're so concerned with quality. And I know there's been some feedback on Facebook, uh, you know, some people not real happy about uh, the fact that we're dragging this on and they, they want the opportunity to get pizza. And I understand that. But uh, we want to make sure that this quality is right. Um, you know, we're, we're, we take such pride in, in what we've built because a lot of it's just it's been blood, sweat, and tears. I hate to use that cliche phrase, but, but it really has. I mean, it's, it's a stressful process anyway because – um, at the end of the day, you're putting your, your livelihood on the line. You're taking time away from your wife and kids and uh, just dealing with the stress of constantly working nonstop. Um, and then, of course, there's a risk factor that's involved. And then even though, like I said, these three guys, I love these guys like brothers, but there's, there's times when it gets it's tense and there's little disagreements and things. And it's all this going on. Um, to put that kind of effort into something, we don't want to turn out a product that, that doesn't meet the hype. And so it's, it's worth it for us to make sure we've got all the kinks worked out. Uh, we've got a great kitchen staff. I want to give, give those guys a shout out because I'm sure they'll listen to this here. We've got, got three guys on now. Uh, of course, my brother's one of them, uh, Paul. Uh, I'm sure you know him as PJ. Most people know him as PJ. But, uh, yeah, Paul, my brother, Nate Argerbright is my cousin. Um, they've both got together. Uh, the two of them have a lot of restaurant experience. Uh, my brother used to, he was an assistant manager at Sonic. He's worked at Arch and Eddie's and Rowdy's and Jackson. Um, my cousin, Nate Argerbright, uh, was originally at the Colonial, uh, stayed on when it became Arch and Eddie's, and then he eventually went to Rowdy's. Uh, so these guys know a lot about the restaurant business, and that's, we wanted to make sure we got them in here because uh, we know a lot about business. Uh, of course, you know, I like to think that we're, we're pretty well-rounded when it comes to that, that side of things, but restaurant business is a little bit different, so we want to make sure we got some guys that could give us some honest feedback and uh, help us get into a good process that's going to work. And then we got a third guy on, uh, Justin Anderson. He's a Wilson High School graduate, uh, young guy, but he is an absolute workhorse, man. Uh, this guy goes 90 miles a minute, and when he comes in the door, you get max effort all the time. So we got those three guys that we can build a, a really good core staff around. Um, of course, we, we've hired some other part-time help to come in uh, and help out too. Most of them, I think, are all family, actually. Uh, but that's what we're going to get this thing off the ground with. Uh, we've actually got a couple more people coming up. Uh, to look at working for us. Um, they're coming up tomorrow just to check it out and see what they think. Uh, but you're just getting people in there that we can trust and get our process worked out. And uh, see if people are patient, it'll all come to fruition. I know uh, it's so the feedback is just been so crazy, and, and we, we're so humbled by the support um, and, and all the positive feedback we're getting. We open the phone lines. We, we try to open it up to the public a little bit. We open the phone lines, and we, we're answering the phone for 35 minutes. And in 35 minutes, we have enough orders to fill five hours. Wow. I mean, that's how that's how crazy the demand is. We've had people send us messages, taking screenshots of their phone where they, they've called three or 400 times trying to get through and can't get through. And, I mean, we wish, like I said, I wish we could we could throw someplace up that had six ovens and 30 guys, and then maybe we could meet that demand. But uh, the way it sits right now, you know, we're going to do our best to get our product right, uh, get as many people served as we can, and then, you know, hopefully <laughs> Saturday we'll be able to get the doors open and, and hopefully at least meet some of it. And I know eventually the hype will wear off. But, uh, yeah, right now it's just kind of crazy. We're, we're excited. We're, we're stressed. It's just kind of a, a hodgepodge of all these emotions. And we're ready to get going, man. It's, it's been a wild ride for sure. That's exciting, man. That's For something new to come into Wellston any time, but to have something new come in with people that I'm friends with, it makes it pretty cool. It makes it pretty special. Um, I know I've known Jeremy a long time. Uh, we, we've been pretty close over the years. We've drifted away. We've gotten close. We, you know, 
Uh, but I, I know him and his family. I really, I really like them, and I really, I really like Nathan Mollahan. You know, Nathan, a little bit older than us, and I never really hung out with Nate except being, you know, playing softball together and things like that. But he's one of those guys, like you said, you talk to him, and he see, he's genuine. He's not, he's not, he's not putting right. on. He's not, he's not saying things that you think he thinks you want to hear. Like, he's just legit genuine. He's always happy to see you. He always, whether I play in a softball tournament or I just pass him, you know, if, if I'm out walking the lake and he's out jogging at the lake or whatever and, and he passes, he's always you know, saying hello, stop the talk. Um, so you got two really good partners there. Um, and, of course, PJ, you know, I haven't saw PJ for years, but uh, I always thought a lot of him too. And the other two, I'm sure it sounds like they're hard workers. I don't, I don't know them personally, but it's good to have that that support, that base of, you know, everybody's in this. It's not just a job. They're in it. They want to see it succeed. They want to get in from that ground floor, Absolutely. help build it up. And all I've seen from uh, Facebook myself, man, you know, I'll, I'll scroll through and you see nothing but people, oh, man, I scored one of these rocket pizzas today. They were great. I've not seen one comment that was negative um, except, like you said, except for the fact that maybe somebody couldn't get through. But – It'll be worth the wait. Like you said, man, get it right first instead of, well, let's, we can make a little bit more money if we rush some of these out there. Yeah, but then people will kind of be turned off by it. So, you know, everybody just hang tight, man. It's going to be, it's going to be worth it. I can't wait to try one, you know, when I get home for sure. I got two things I'm doing when I get home. One is going to see Bird Mannering in concert and two is to come up there and, and, and get, and get a pizza from you guys. So. I'm definitely excited about that and uh, proud of you guys, man. Again, anything that can bring any kind of business and excitement into into that town, because man, it's I've said it before. I think I was talking to Chuck Milliken on a recent episode. It's hard. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to go back, dude. It's every time I'm away for longer and longer periods, because obviously I'm still based there. You know, mom and dad are still there. Um, I still mm-hmm. live there when I'm home. But man, it's 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 sad. It's, uh, you go uptown and there's, that you can walk through town on a Saturday and there's, you don't see a car in the middle of town. You yeah. might, you might see two or three parked, but you don't see anything, which now with you guys opening up, and I think you said you were going to have a little patio out front. I think we're going to see, yeah. I think we're going to start to see maybe a little bit more flow of traffic through that area. And, uh, I know they're working on some, some things to hopefully get the Lou V, you know, renovated and open back up to where they can at least do like, plays and things like that so hopefully that's that's the step in the right direction for that town because man i know it, it's it's taken a beat in the last 20 years it's not the same town we grew up in um no. and i know we've talked about that a lot going you know basing it on just businesses and sports and all this stuff how the town's like it's in need of some uh, an injection of something we're <laughs> bringing that ped you know talk full circle it needs a it needs an injection of some uh some peds in that town man because it's it was a great town to grow up in, you know. It uh-huh. it just was. We had a lot of fun. Um, th- you know, things were booming even uptown. You, I know the theater's been closed for geez, what twenty five years now. Um, but yeah, it, a long time. I I think I think there was a couple of guys that had it open. I remember I worked at uh, at First National Bank back when it was still open at the time uh, that they kind of split ways, and I think that so that would have been. My best guess would be 03 or 04 would have been the most recent time. So, yeah, it's, it's coming up on you know, 20 years where we haven't had a theater. I have, uh, and you're right. I mean, mm-hmm. go ahead. I had heard that, uh, and I don't know if this is fact, I had heard that one of the people who owned that, um, other people wanted to buy it, but this guy wouldn't sell it unless they signed some agreement to where they couldn't like open a movie theater there for like 50 years or something crazy um, because he, yeah, did, he didn't want them to compete. Kind of, yeah. It's like, bro, yeah. come on, man. No contest clause. And I'm not sure what the details of it were, but yeah, that, that left a lot of sour taste in people's mouths. And so what, what happens now is that building sits there and dilapidates to the point where it's, it's borderline a health hazard. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, fortunately, you know, not, not to bash anybody, you can't change what's happened in the past, but you know, we've got some good people now that are willing to take it on and, and try to do something. I think their goal, if I'm not mistaken, is to turn it into like a performing arts center or something. Right. And, and that's fine, man. That, that's one more building that's not sitting empty mm-hmm. and not being an eyesore. And you've got people that are willing to put in the hard work and get it done. But, you know, I'm glad you brought that around because uh, th- that's one of the biggest things for us. I mean, of course, everybody's in it to make money. You don't start a business if you don't think you can make a little bit of money. Sure. But the more important thing for us is, is our, you're right, our community is in desperate, desperate need 
of people that are willing to make some sacrifices and put a little bit of effort, you know, time and resources into it. And unfortunately, I think you're starting to see that. There's a lot of good places. Um, we, we've got a great Mexican restaurant in town. I hope if people don't understand already, I hope that they, they do eventually understand how much uh, Juan Rios is the guy's name that opened Viva Jalisco in Wilson, mm-hmm. how much he's really done for that downtown area. Um, that, that's a great place to eat. You know, my family, we eat there all the time. Um, and he, I think he kind of he was able to weather the storm. I know he had some hiccups early on. Uh, but he, he's weathered the storm, and he's been there for a while now. Uh, he's got a good customer base, and he's been able to hang on. And, and since he's done that, you're starting to see these other little places pop up. I know uh, there's a craft place called Darling Creations down on Ohio Avenue that is doing very well. Um, so you're starting to see little pieces of life there, uh, here and there. And I think if we can kill the, this mentality that uh, – uh, well, a friend of mine actually told this to me when he found out we are going to open Rocket Pizza. Um, he said, you'll find out that, that with Wells and the attitude that you get is – People want to see people succeed, but then they hate successful people. Mm. And I think if you can get get past that mentality where um, you don't hate on the guys, if you don't like what we're doing, that's fine. But but let us try it. You know, let's try to do something right. And, and if we fail, we fail. And that's that'll be on us. But there's got to be more people that are willing to say, you know what? Um, anything that comes in, we're going to do our best to support it. And if I can get a good good meal here in town. Uh, let's get going to Chillicothe or somewhere else, and let's, let's try to keep our dollars here for a little while uh, and see how that goes. But there, there's a lot of good business establishments, and that's that's something uh, Nathan actually put a post on our, our Facebook page uh, this past week where you know he reiterated the fact that we're, we're not in this to put anybody out of business. In fact, um, it's more the opposite. We want – there's a piece of the pie in this for all of us. Um, you know, we want everybody to succeed. I'll still shop at Giovanni's. Um, of course, these, these are all friends that you've known for years too. I mean – Terry Brennan, we we had him in high school. Um, I think Aaron might be running the place now. We went to school with these guys. Yes, I'm going to support their business. You know, they're doing a different thing than we're doing. You know, they they offer different products, and and we'll still eat there. And, and we hope that they'll come and shop with us. Um, you know, Domino's. There's all kinds of places around that you know people would normally look at us as being competitors with. But that's that's not the mentality we have. You know, we want to work together with these guys and make sure that we all succeed and make sure that you know we help drive each other's business. You know, there's going to be nights where, where we're hammered and we might not be able to take the load, and maybe that will help Giovanni's out, uh, and vice versa. You know, Maybe they're, they're slammed and, and people don't want to wait that long on a Giovanni's pizza. Maybe they'll come down and, and have some of ours. Um, so I just think there's if we can keep the positive mentality and the momentum going that we have right now, uh, maybe you'll start to see some things change. But, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting time, man. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's stressful, and then sometimes you get scared and you get worried, but, uh, you just got to stay positive and look at the light at the end of the tunnel and, and remind yourself why you're in this thing. And, and it's bigger than us. It's, it's bigger than us individually. And that's why I wanted to bring those guys that we, we got on our staff right now and mention them because I don't ever, if we succeed, I don't ever want to be one of these guys that when it's time to get a picture in the paper, it's all the three owners mm-hmm. and you don't see what's going on behind the scenes because, you know, really all we did was put our names and, and get the money in. When it gets to right down to how successful this thing is going to be, it's going to be the people working for us. So, you know, we want to make sure we treat them right and make sure they get the recognition they deserve and, and kind of raise the standard on how things are done in our area. Well said, man. You, you, you don't see that a lot. Cause like you said, it's, it's always the people who – like like you go into Peking Cook, and I love Peking Cook, right? But how many people know that place is called Peking Cook or how many people think that place is called Johnny's? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's like it, – it's like that's, that's who you think of. You think of Johnny and his wife, Johnny and his wife. And they do a great job, but – it's not them. It's not them doing the cooking. You know, I know his wife does some stuff back there, and I'm sure Johnny does occasionally. But there's yeah. a lot of good staff back there that's throwing together some good daggone food. Um, mm-hmm. and, and you mentioned yeah. uh, Viva Jalisco. I've actually eaten there a couple times over the last few years. Again, I'm never there, so, you know, I, I don't frequent any place. But um, I've eaten there a few times, and I, I really dig it. I, I think it's good food, and I'm glad that, to hear that they're doing, a, you know, a pretty successful job there. Um like you said, man, just support that community if you can. You got the goal line, and you know I grew up with Scott. Yeah. I, I think a lot of Scott. Yep. Um, I, even when I'm home, I don't necessarily go in there a whole lot because you know, you know me, dude. That's a, a bar scene is, is kind of not my scene. Um, yeah. But we'll get veals from there. He's got really good veals. He's got you know he's got good pizza, um, and I hope he's yep. successful. But like you said, I hope yeah. this. I hope this brings business to him i hope it brings business to, to giovanni's i hope it brings business to the store i hope it brings business to you guys just make it yeah. it, it shouldn't be competitive 
I mean, when it all comes down to it, do you hope you make more money? Well, sure. But you also hope that, that, that people give all of those places a chance. Um, I don't remember what Rocket Pizza tastes like specifically, but I remember being in there as a kid. I remember, you know, uh, basketball parties, I think, for the herd. So I would have been in, yeah. geez, third grade, fourth grade. I remember pictures being in there. I remember what it looked like. I remember the setup with the ta- how the tables were arranged. I remember all that stuff, but I don't necessarily remember exactly what it tastes like. But I think, I think nostalgia is so huge right now in everything that pe- people want a taste of that stuff that they miss. Even if they don't remember what it tastes like, they still see that, oh, man, Rocket Pizza. Um, yeah. and, and which is a good thing, you know, like then they'll give it a try and they'll be like, oh yeah, I remember why I love this. Um, even people who yeah. might've been away from town for so many years or people who only come back for reunions every year. Well, maybe they're more apt. Well, man, I haven't had rocket pizza in 25 years. Maybe they're more apt to, to, to come in and, and, you know, support you guys. So that's a really cool thing. It was really neat that uh that you guys because it's just called it's just called rocket pizza right you guys didn't put anything else on it like the original rocket pizza or something like that we did yeah yeah it's just just as an an effort to kind of to make sure that everybody understands that it's the original recipe so we call it the original rocket pizza of wellston perfect um just kind of try to rebrand it so we got a little logo and um, got our got actually have a nice sign up out front now that's uh it's actually metal cut on a rough barn wood background uh, so you get kind of that rustic, rustic theme. So it's, yeah, it's cool, man. We're we're really trying to try to do it the right way, and you know, hopefully we get some merchandise out pretty soon, some t-shirts and hats and and things, and really, really put it out there, man. We just want to create a nice environment where you know a family can come in and hang out, and you know, if dad wants to have a drink or two, you know, we'll have our liquor license, but sure. uh, you know, we don't want that bar crowd in there where people are acting acting goofy, but. You know, have, have a cold drink, kind of like the BW3s or someplace like that. Right, uh, and I'm I, I'm yeah. not I'm not knocking like anything with the goal line or anything. I hope it didn't come out like I was knocking oh, that sure. place. No, um, absolutely not. But even like uh, even Pizza Pub, you know, <clears throat> if I go to pizza if I go to Pizza Pub, I'm gonna sit outside. I'm not gonna go up to the counter where people are, you know, because again, drinking's just not my thing. It's not my scene. I'm not super comfortable around it. It's just it's not it's not for me. So I, I right. tend to kind of stay away from those. If I'm in if I'm at B Dubs, I'm not sitting at the bar. And unless it's you know crowded yeah. and it's lunch and I have to, you know I'm setting away. I'm setting back in the table somewhere. Um, but give me a little bit like as far as besides the recipe, the taste of the pizza. Wh- what are you guys trying to set yourself apart from everybody? What are you doing differently um, as far as menu wise? Do you have anything mapped out yet? Are they going to be? Is it just going to be pizza? Are you going to have pizza and sandwiches? Are you going to have? Give me a little bit of of what your menu is going to look like. Well, eventually, we want to, we want to have the whole works. Obviously, <laughs> you know, we we got big dreams and, and big goals, but you know, starting out, there's just some challenges you have to overcome. So we'll integrate that stuff eventually. I think initially, um, we'll definitely have pizza. Uh, probably be able to do some sandwiches. Uh, probably won't have much appetizers or anything like that right off, but that's eventually something we want to get into. Um, but as far as what what I think will set us apart is we we always wanted this to be a place where when you walk in, you question whether or not you're really in Wellston. That's how. That's how good we want the atmosphere to be. That's how good we want the quality to be. And that's the kind of customer service we want to have. Um, one, of the, one of the things that Nathan says that I think is so important that, that Bear is mentioning is he said, you know, he understands that your time is valuable. And, and how many nights do you sit around, man, I'm hungry. I don't really want to cook. What can we get to eat? And you're going back and forth with your wife and you're trying to figure out, okay, well, we get this. Well, we just had that last week. Well, what about this place? Well, the kids don't want to eat there tonight. And he's going back, and he finally decided on some place to eat. And then you go into this place, and you either get bad food or bad customer service or something, and it just ruins your whole night. So we want to make sure that, that people's time is honored when you, when you come to our place, that you leave. Even if, even if you don't like the food, you can say, man, at least I got good customer service, and that's a good atmosphere in there, and, and that's the kind of place that we want to frequent. So um, like I said, we want to raise the standard and. Uh, one, of, one of the things I would like to do is eventually when we get full staff hired, I'd like to shut the place down for a day and take them all up to you know Columbus that's the, where you can find a really busy restaurant that's just rocking all the time and, and see how efficient the waitress is and, and how that interaction goes and use that kind of as a learning experience because I want to bring that culture you know back to our area. And, again, that's not knocking any place around here. I'm not saying I haven't experienced super bad customer service anywhere in Wilson. Um, I, I couldn't remember the last time if there was a time. Uh, but just it's always just the, the constant striving to be better and, and to be the best that we can be. So 
uh, that's one thing we want to make a commitment to, to make sure that you have a good atmosphere and good customer service, and we'll we'll do our best to make sure you have a good quality product that's not overpriced and, and that everybody can comfortably enjoy, and, and hopefully we can do that. Very cool, man. So what uh, what size are you going to have? A couple different sizes of pizza? What's the uh, Whatever the prices be? Throw out some of that stuff for me. Yeah, okay. So we actually, uh, we were initially going to go with 8-inch, eight, uh, eight 10-inch, 12-inch, 16-inch, uh, and 18-inch. Uh, and we actually ran, uh, for most of the trial week, we ran 18 inches. Um, but a piece of equipment that we have, we have a dough roller that kind of it pushes this stuff out so we can get it on the pan. Um, it's not quite capable of doing an 18 inch in an efficient amount of time. You really have to work with it to get it out there. And, and we sold in our trial period, the majority of the pieces that we sold uh, have been 18 inches. But uh, until we can find a solution for that dough roller, we're going to cut those out for a little while and just cap it off at 16. So we'll have 8-inch, eight, eight 10-inch, 12-inch, uh, and 16-inch. Uh, then we'll have some sandwiches. Our sandwiches uh, are, are just about a foot long, uh, so we'll offer a small and a large. A small will just be a half. Uh, we're still kind of trying to work out some kinks and practice on the sandwiches. Uh, but the pizzas, I think, are pretty much ready to go. Uh, right now we've got a 16-inch, uh, one-topping pizza priced at 15 and a quarter. Uh, we feel like that's pretty competitive. And of course, all these, there's a lot of metrics that go into this pricing. And eventually we may have to adjust it, but uh, we're trying, like I said, we're trying to uh, provide a price that is um, equal to the quality and still affordable for our area. Um, and we, we've researched some competitor pricing and things like that uh, to try to get in that pocket too. So we'll see how that goes, but that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. Very cool, man. And as far as the seating, what's what's the seating look like inside? You got some got some tables inside. I know you said you had a couple a couple places on the patio, which obviously, you know, December in Ohio, probably not going to be using the patio a whole lot, but, um, you know, coming up <laughs> as far as the spring and the summer, it's going to be awesome to be able to see people sitting out there and, and having a pizza and whatever. But as far as inside, what's the seating capacity? Seating right now, we can get uh, comfortably in there about 30, uh, between 29 and 30. Of course, it's a small building. Um, but the way we've got it set up, I think about 30 seats would be comfortable. Uh, eventually, we might throw uh, four or five stools up at the bar. Um, again, not trying to create the bar atmosphere, but just uh, you know, get guys coming home from work and just want to stop in and, and have a drink and just get a bite to eat real quick, sit there, maybe catch a game. They can do that. Uh, we'll probably, uh, to avoid some of the riffraff kind of crowd, uh, we'll probably try to cap the hours about 10 o'clock during the week, maybe 11 o'clock on uh, Friday and Saturday nights. Uh, so we're not going to be one of these. You know, you're not going to see people rolling in and out there at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be that kind of place. But uh, again, just more like the BW threes type atmosphere. Uh, the inside, we've kind of refinished. We got lucky, and a guy that Jeremy and Nathan knew uh, from back where they went to school had just torn down a barn um, in Circleville about the time we were ready to start rehabbing our building. Uh, got a hold of this guy, and we were able to purchase a lot of reused barn wood and tin barn ceiling. Uh, that actually came off of an old bar, and we got a really good deal on it. So uh, when you walk in the front door to the left and then behind our counter area is completely finished with this old rustic barn wood. Um, the walls in the dining area halfway up are shiplap that are all trimmed out in that rough-cut barn wood. The ceiling is the actual tin roof ceiling that was off of that barn. It has recessed can lights. Uh, the lights are on a dimmer switch. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we put a lot of work into really making the place look nice, and we're very, very happy with how it turned out. Uh, if you go in there during the day without uh, the electric lights on, with the windows letting in some natural light, uh, it's, just, it's it's really beautiful. And, of course, uh, I'm probably biased saying that, but I think people will really be impressed when they walk in. Very cool, man. Can't wait to see it. Um, what's the address? What's the phone number? You got some, uh, you got any, like, a Twitter handle, anything on Instagram, Facebook, things like that you want to plug and put out there? We do have an Instagram. Um, I'm not sure what the what the handle. I'm not an Instagram guy. My brother's actually kind of handling that for us. <laughs> of course, we have our Facebook page, the Original Rocket Pizza Wilson LLC. Uh, you can follow us on there. Uh, phone number is seven four zero eight five five forty two seventy one. Of course, those those lines because of the demand are kind of open on a limited basis right now. But we're trying. Hopefully, we can get that uh, full open by this weekend. Very cool, man. Oh, the address. You asked me, asked me for the address. The address is 114 South Ohio Avenue in Wellston, right across from Milton Bank. Very cool, dude. Like I said, I can't wait to do it, and I think you got two really good partners there, and it sounds like you have a good, uh, you know, a good working staff. What did the wives think? What did the wives think when you guys kind of, you know, when you first came to them with this idea? Were they on board at first? <laughs> well, I, I think so, of course. Uh, that's another thing. I, I talked about how blessed I was to have great parents, man. I, I can't say enough about my wife. 
Um, I, I've never – she has supported me through things when she probably shouldn't have. <laughs> I'll tell you, man, she's, she's just been really great. Of course, you know, there's always the question, have you guys really thought this through? Do you really want to do this? <laughs> you know, you hear all these horror stories about never start businesses with your friends and, and all this stuff. And, you know, we all wade into all that. But at the end of the day, they saw how passionate we were about it, and they've been gung-ho. Uh, just just like we are, they've been up there helping us get stuff ready. Um, all of them have worked up there in some capacity. I know uh, Heather was up there helping me. Jeremy's wife was up there helping me run uh, the point of sale system the other night. Uh, Amanda's been back and forth uh, between the point of sale system and helping customers in the kitchen. Uh, Mandy's been back in the kitchen and washing dishes. So they've, they've been just as involved since we've got this thing kind of off the ground as we have. And, uh, yeah, I just can't say enough about it, man. I don't, I don't think we would be successful. Um, or even have a shot at being successful the way we want to uh, without their backing, without their support. So, uh, yeah, we've been pretty blessed in that regard. Now, I'm sure early on they were, they were probably, you know, are, are we really ready for this? And, of course, it's, it speaks volumes to their patience because, you know, like I said, I, I feel like the last two or three months at least, I've seen my wife and kids maybe three or four hours a week because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an early riser. I get up early, get ready for work. I'm at work in Pike County at uh, about 8 o'clock. Uh, get home about 4:35, grab a bite to eat, change clothes, and then I'm going to work at the building uh, to do that kind of stuff. And I'm there till probably 9, 9:30, sometimes 10 o'clock. Uh, you come home, you see kids for a minute, jump in the shower, uh, get to bed, and start the next day. Do the same thing all over. Uh, hopefully, on a weekend, you can catch a little break and spend some time with them. Then, so uh, I bring that up just to emphasize the sacrifice that our spouses have to make because we're not around as much as I'm sure they'd like us to be. Uh, but but they've all been great. Mandy and Heather and Amanda have all just been wonderful uh, wonderfully supportive uh, can't say enough about them very cool man i hope you know though i'm editing all the good stuff you said about amanda out of this <laughs> <laughs> I, ki- I kid i kid of course i know obviously i know all three of your wives and i really think a lot of them heather's actually been on some uh been on some uh football game trips with myself and jeremy and uh i know mandy from the ball fields you know being with nate and obviously amanda heck we go back quite a long ways and some some stories, some stories there we won't necessarily get into on this uh, <laughs> on this podcast, but uh, <laughs> or maybe ever, maybe we'll just never get into those stories. That might be better, huh? We'll just leave those. We'll leave those as memories. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, dude, I'm glad that I'm glad you guys are doing well. I'm glad you decided to come on. I'm glad we could get, could get this done. Um, good luck with it. When I heard you guys are doing this, I was like, that's three good dudes right there. And I really, really hope you're successful. And I don't see any reason why you shouldn't be. Um, I know people are clamoring for this. and uh, But as we talked about, I want to go back and reemphasize, man, support you guys for sure. But support the goal line. Support, you know, Pizza Pub. Support Giovanni's. Absolutely. Support Viva Jalisco's. Support Peking Cook. Support all the, uh, the store. Um, I don't know of many people who do more for that town than, than Jason Hoseapple, obviously, at the store, man. And, you oh, know. Absolutely. He's been a really good dude, really solid dude up there, and uh, they got some good pizza, man. I like the store's pizza. I really, you know, I do. Anytime I'm home, I'll go up there and get a pizza or two, you know, if I'm there for a couple months. But um, definitely support all those folks. Bring some, bring some life back into that town. Get those daggone for sale signs out of all, you know, every third yard that you see. Um, Right. It's uh, getting back to that point, man. It's when I come home, I see that, and I see. We've talked about it before, and I've seen in, in some fa- – you know, we won't get into this too much, but into some some Facebook posts that not so much anymore. But, you know, when, when I would see your responses to some of them, I'm like, man, Matt Matt needs to be – he needs to run for some office in that town because, dude, I, I think highly of you in that regard. I'm not kidding, man. You're, you're so sharp. You're so, you're so smart. I tell Dad that all the time. I'm like, of all the guys I went to school with, the guys I know, like I put your level of intelligence – um, the way you see things politically and, and just how things are ran, man. I, I enjoy reading your post. I enjoy listening when you're talking about it. And uh, I could see you, you know, getting into something like that if that's what, you know, if that's what you desired. Obviously, now you got your, your hands full with this place, and, and I'm proud of you for that. But just hopefully this will help, uh, you know, help bring some, some revenue into that economy there in that town. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what we hope. I mean, like I said, and we, when we interview our staff, uh, the guys that we've got bring, coming on, you know, one of the things that we stress to them is, is we want you to be just as proud of this as we are. And we want you to understand that when we say we want to create a team culture uh, where we're not any more important than you are, we really mean that. I know you know a lot of employers say that and their actions say something else. 
Um, you hear these horror stories about bad work environments and all that stuff, man. That, that's not us. You know, you'll never see anybody farther from a tyrant than me. Yeah, that, that's just not me. I, I want to work with people, and I want them to, to be as passionate about it as we are and, and understand that they're part of something that's bigger than just this little business and just this little pizza place, man. We want to be the start of something that, that brings back an atmosphere like used to be, like you hear our parents talk about the way Wellston used to be. Uh, we've talked about trying to do some community events on our on our little corner there. We've, got, we've been blessed with all that land, uh, get our patio open, have stuff out there for the kids, and, and do some stuff maybe – uh, during baseball, see, I mean, there's just there's so many different things that that we have vision for and want to do. Um, so, you know, hopefully we can keep everybody on board and and get the, the whole community involved. And, and ultimately, like I said, the goal is to, I, I firmly believe that any successful economy, business drives business. Um, and, and Juan from Viva Jalisco actually came down the other night and said that uh, one of the nights that we opened our phone, we were so busy, he was busier. Oh wow! And, and that's what we want, you know. Yeah, I, I want people. I, I'm just like you. I, of course, I, I just I specifically mentioned Giovanni just because that's the first place that came to mind. But I'm glad you brought all those other guys up because because we do want to support them. Man, we used to go down to the goal line a good bit, mm-hmm. and since we've been into into this, we just haven't had time. Um, but yeah, I still want to support all those guys, man. I love goal line's got good wings. I, uh, that's one of my favorite things to get there. Uh, Jason, you mentioned the pizza. I like Jason's sandwiches. Uh, Giovanni's, we love their pizza, their food. Uh, that's a mean buffet over there, man. If you ever or in town, I always tell people coming in town that that's, if you want a buffet, man, that's a good one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's yeah, there's all kinds of places to eat, um, all kinds of to, people to support, and just uh, yeah, keep keep the positive mentality going, man. I think that's the key. All right, man. Well, Matt Peterson from the original Rocket Pizza, hopefully opening on Saturday the seventh. We'll see, but uh, give him a call. You uh, again, go ahead and mention the phone number one more time, Matt, and we'll uh, we'll kind of bring this to an end. Okay, man. Yeah, phone number is 740-855-4271, and we'll post, uh, until we're fully open, we'll post on our Facebook page when we'll have that open, uh, give, give people a chance to put, put orders in. Very good, man. All right, Matt, well, again, I appreciate you doing this. Say hey to Jeremy and Nate, and also the wives. Tell them, you know, tell everybody hey for me. I'm proud of you guys. Keep rocking, and I can't, uh, I can't wait to see how good the business does, and I can't wait to try one when I get home. Awesome, man. Looking forward to it. All right, Matt, I'll talk to you soon, buddy, okay? Hey, thanks, Brent. How's it going, buddy? All right, you too, my man. See ya. We'll see ya. Okay, guys, that was my interview with Matt Peterson. Be sure to give uh, the original Rocket Pizza of Wellston a, a check out here pretty soon. Follow him on Facebook at the original Rocket Pizza of Wellston LLC. Uh, be, be patient with them. They're still working out some kinks. They're still kind of doing this soft opening where they're only taking, you know, taking orders for certain times throughout the day. I've seen some nasty comments on Facebook uh, for 99% have been really positive, but there's been some nasty comments that I've seen recently about people who uh, who are, are frustrated with with uh, not being able to place their order. Give them time. They're still new. They're getting all the kinks worked out. Um, support them. This this business is going to be ran by three really great families. Uh, they're going to bring some some good business back into to Wellston. And and like we said in the interview, like Matt said, like I said, don't just support these guys here. Support everybody. Support all the local businesses. Help bring some uh, a much needed shot in the arm back to to that town and, and uh, get things built back up. Get it to you know get it back to the way it used to be whenever whenever I was a kid and and uh, you could go up and always find something to do, some place to hang out. So anyway, thanks for listening to the interview. Check them out at the Original Rocket Pizza, and we'll be back soon with the next episode of Brent Ewing's Hey Buddy podcast.